Shalom, Exact and Truth Body Fellowship members, and of course, the Exact and Truth landscape of Body Fellowship believers across that food plane that fellowship with us, irrespective of where your membership may lie. Welcome to another and uh, in today's case, quite impromptu, Exacting Truth Ministries Saturday Sabbath Facebook Live. I'm your host this morning, Shepherd Solaire, our man. Junior pastor and leading emissary at Exactly Truth Ministries in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Will you please bow your heads and pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day that your mighty hand has made. We thank you for life, health, and strength. We thank you for food, shelter, and clothing. We thank you for protection and provision with regards to our families, our children, our relatives, loved ones, our friends, co workers, neighbors, even our enemies today. We're asking right now that uh, you come into this fellowship, into uh, this service, into this presentation and gathering of believers, and we're asking that you have your way. We pray that you order our steps. We pray that you receive our prayer, our praise, our posture of worship, that it's pleasing in your sight, Most High. We're asking right now that you continue to have your way. We're Thank you for bringing us into another year, new possibilities. We're asking that you let your light shine through us. We're asking that you live big inside of us. We're asking right now that you allow the exacted truth, uh, the truth that uh, you have placed in our hearts and placed in our understanding. We're asking that you let the orthodoxy of your scripture Go out and spread and disseminate among your people and among this globe. We're living in a tumultuous age, and we're asking right now that you allow the truth to outstand a lie. We're asking right now for your healing graces, Heavenly Father, with regards to those who have been sick and infirmed. I thank you for sustaining even myself as we have sojourned through uh, the battle of illness and how you've given us the uh, stability to be able to continue and to be able to be a light and to stand and minister despite how we have felt, despite how we feel. We're asking right now that you remember those. There are so many people that are even in worse condition. And we're asking Heavenly Father, without uh, calling out the names, you know the names, there are so many people an innumerable amount of people that stand in lieu of your healing graces. And we're asking that you remember them right now, Heavenly Father. And we ask once again that you send your word. Speak in our hearing. Let it be you and not we ourselves. And as we incline our ears, minister grace to every hearer and allow us to leave this fellowship the better for coming, no longer the same. Remember those that need remembering everywhere. We say it exactly in truth ministries. Those who are fearful, skeptical, unbelieving, decompressing, uh, turning to new age occultism and whatever it is exploring metaphysical planes rather than admit to the validity and the reality of your Holy Spirit and of the power of your presence. We're asking that you give us the ability and the strength not to blame you when men have failed us and what mankind continues to do, man's inhumanity to man. And we're asking once again that uh, you have your way. Let this live stream be a blessing to all those that witness it and we ask these blessings and many more in that great name Yeshua Yahushua HaMashiach in Christ's name we pray amen Shabbat Shalom everyone blessed Saturday Sabbath to each and every one of you all we're glad that you all are gathering we know that so many people are disappointed we were supposed to be in the first of our uh, live in person Saturday Sabbaths, and we had something powerful uh, prepared and planned. And uh, we're just asking your forgiveness, but uh, we have been in a ongoing battle for our health and well being, Shepherd Man, that is. And we thank you for your prayers. We feel your prayers. Continue to pray for us. We're praying for you. We thank the Most High, the Almighty, for having the strength to be able to gather uh, today. And to be able to share, not feeling 100%, not going to be before you long. I'm not going to press it. We're not trying to uh, solicit people to pity us. 
Uh, we thank the Most High for strength. We are in a quite critical position and place ourselves weekly in a critical position, ministering uh, live in person at uh, three ministries, at least two of those ministries every week. People hollering and praising and saying hallelujah, thank you. And, uh, all of that spittle and all those things in the air and everything. And although we try to do what we can to be healthy, to be of a healthy weight, have a healthy diet, I'm just testifying a little bit if y'all allow me to. And uh, bolster our immune system and wear several masks and things of this nature. If anybody has seen any of the Macedonia live streams, when the camera hit me, you'll see me playing and uh, even a little bit of singing that I do. You'll see me singing through a mask because, listen, it's not that we don't have faith and things could have been so much worse than most high have sustained us. Uh, I'm not ashamed to uh, say through several uh, COVID contractions but I'm telling you, man, the doctors are concerned, family's concerned, but we're trusted in the most high and well, we're uh, considering wisely what our steps are going to be moving forward because, listen, we're not going to just continue to tempt the devil. But at the same time, once again, he has given us strength to be able to tread upon serpents. And we thank you for your prayer. And we're here. We're here to minister. Listen, we're looking forward to next week. We're looking forward to uh, full and free recovery so that on January the 28th, we can join together in fellowship. A good friend and brother of mine and a sister of mine, uh, Pastor Aguilar, Christian Aguilar and his wife Amina, they're coming to uh, guest praise and worship and just uh, bring, you know, that powerful praise and excitement that uh, Pastor Christian always does with his ministry and his musicianship. And we're going to be there, you know, with a powerful word uh, if the Lord wills. And so just put it, mark it on your calendar. Let's get excited. But right now we're here, another Saturday Sabbath. Shabbat Shalom to each and every one of you all Sabbath keepers. Thank you for gathering. We don't take it for granted. And you all know the tradition at Exact and Truth Ministries. We hold up the Holy Writ. Why? Because it contains words of the Most High and words that were left on record for our learning. So symbolically, we look up to it. We hold it up because we look up to it and not down to our own understanding. We know the scripture states that we ought to look into the hills from it cometh our help. Our help cometh from the Most High that has made the heavens and the earth. And so, beloved, at this time, we're going to ask you, if you will, to join us in the Greek scriptures, more commonly known as the New Testament. And we're going to uh, Paul the Apostle's first letter to the body Ecclesia at Corinth. First Corinthians chapter 9. We're going to be reading in your hearing verses 19 through 27. We've got a cautionary word. We've got a cautionary admonishment this morning. That don't mean that y'all run for the hills. We're not trying to tear nobody down. We're trying to build you up. Scripture says he chasing who he loves. And we have a cautionary tale that the Most High deposited into my spirit and in my personal communication and interaction with the Most High, my own bishop and uh, Dr. Peter Green, if he will see this uh, actual message, but I know that Bishop is uh, with us uh, in fellowship and he'll understand this. What is it, Lord? Boy, that Mother Russell Bishop, uh, in my own personal interactions and conferring with the Heavenly Father, what is it with all of this mild irritating sickness and we don't complain because once again there's so many people who have dealt with what i'm dealing with and they did not get the better of it it got the best of them so i'm grateful for the most high sustenance but yet and still whew, it has been a, a journey and in my own personal conferring with the most high what is it lord he shared with me honestly uh a cautionary tale and a synopsis of what we're seeing today and he said share it what I'm sharing with you with my people. So for a brief time, we're going to share back to the reading of the writ. If you would join us, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 through 27. And today we're going to be referencing the new international version of the English translation. We'd be much obliged if you join us there. Herein is the reading of the Holy Writ, beloved. And it reads as thus. I'm going to stop doing so much repeating to make sure you have it because y'all looking at the screen and it's up on the screen. So, reads as thus, beloved. Though I am free 
and belong to no one. Paul states, I have made myself a slave to everyone. What? To win as many as possible. Now, some of you all, y'all ready to log off now because you're like, listen, I'm not going to be nobody's slave. But we've got to continue to read so we can understand what Paul the Apostle is saying in context. Amen. Verse 20, the Jews, to the Jews, rather, excuse me, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, Paul states, so as to win those under the law. 21, to those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, the most high God of the Hebrews, of course, but am under Christ's law, Paul states. So as to win those not having the law. 22, to the weak, I became weak to win the weak. Paul's been pretty busy here. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. Now that don't sound like Paul is decompressing. That don't sound like Paul is compromising. That don't sound like Paul is trying to decompress or take some type of alternative route like some people may have discerned in reading the first of these verses that we read, starting with verse 19, it seems like that he is bolstering his actions and that he is increasing his effort in order to reach as many as possible and to shine his light before as many people so that they can see good works and glorify his father, which is in heaven. But I digress. Verse 23, I do all this for the sake of the gospel, Paul states, that I may share in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize. What, they wasn't giving out participation trophies in his day? I'm sorry, let me continue. Run in such a way as to get the prize, Paul states. 25, everyone that competes in the games goes into strict training. Strict, he states. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Hallelujah. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. And finally, in 27, no, I strike a blow to my body, my Lord, and make it my slave, Paul states, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. For the prize. Hallelujah. May the Most High add a blessing and an enriching to the reading of the Holy Writ. Beloved, for the duration of the time that is allotted to me to minister to you this morning, the title of our text is simply titled, A Raggedy Walk is Far Better Than a Dressed Up Ride. Amen. Beloved, as we have aforementioned, we have, particularly in the last year span, sojourned through quite a journey of inconvenience at the most part with regards to the slight maladies that we've endured in this flesh. And once again, we thank the Most High for all that he's done. We thank all of you all for your continued prayers and we just believe in the power of sustenance. We believe in the power of healing, but sometimes it is within the will of the Most High for whatever his purpose is for us, for us to endure trial and suffering. And so we endure it uh, and we press and we persevere because as Paul stated, we too believe that in that perseverance in the end is a reward and a crown, amen? So uh, once again, we stand, but we stand relating with all those who are suffering, whether it is an infirmity in your flesh or whether it's some other type of suffering. Realize not only that you're not alone, but that in faith and in hope and in dedication and being dedicated and uh, being long-suffering and steadfast, 
hopefully showing some degree or modicum of what it means to remain faithful and to remain and stand in faith despite what it is that you're enduring. Of course, the enemy desires, as scripture says, to sift us as wheat, that we've got to be very careful and cautious because the enemy's efforts and his adversarial attempts to throw us off course not only can be quite powerful, but can also be quite tempting. But enough of that because today's sermon is not about me. If anything, with regard to the, yeah, boy, that's quite a title, Shepherd Man. You got to realize that no matter your lot, as the hymn says, no matter and despite my lot, thou hast caused me to say it is well. And no matter how hard it is sometimes to be able to say that, no matter what you're enduring, no matter how raggedy your circumstances may seem, despite the raggediness of your circumstance, it's still a blessing to be on the journey and to be on the path, irrespective of how it looks. Now, I'm a child of the 70s. Let's get down to the brass tacks of this text. And I grew up in church settings where a quite common sermonic theme, beloved, was the popular adage and cautionary proverb, the antithesis of converse of our play on this proverb we're getting ready to state this morning is what the title of our text is, the converse, but the actual proverb and adage is a raggedy ride. I know some of me, so many of you all realize this is better than a dressed up walk. A raggedy ride is better than a dressed up walk. The principle of this particular saying was for a person to understand that in life, living honestly and presenting oneself as real and making the attempt to reach your goals and to fulfill one's purpose truthfully, even if that means in many regards, you appear to struggle at times. Well, that should always be preferred to deceiving everyone by putting up fronts, as it were, appearing to fit the part, however, in reality, you're actually faking it in hopes that eventually you'll make it. So the wisdom in that saying is even if your ride is raggedy, it's hard to get a date back then and even in this day and time, if you have a raggedy ride. But yet and still, the wisdom is that a raggedy ride is better than a dressed up walk. I caution you this morning not to take the bait. Don't relax your morals and do not abandon your principles of faith and obedience. Don't begin to take the easy way out. Do not follow today's largely sacrilegious society down the path of decompressing from all attempts at being Christ-like and upholding the light afforded to us through the grace obtained by his sacrifice on the cross. Resist the growing impulse and trend to simply hide amidst the growing chorus of new age Christian mediocrity. Okay, I appreciate all of those exhortations and admonishments, shepherd man, but what does that have to do with your flipping the title with regards to a raggedy ride is better than a dressed up walk? We must never forget the words of the Christ captured in the gospel of Matthew chapter seven, verses 13 and 14, which state, enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. In other words, beloved, don't take days off. It's not about the path of least resistance, as so many would have for you to believe in this day and time. This actually 
is not a popularity contest where you need to be where the most people will approve of what you're doing. Despite what the advent of social media in this day and time would tell us, despite the shameless self-promotion that goes on online, in spite of all of that and what that would have for you to believe, this is not a popularity contest, beloved. This may not appear, what we're stating that is, as and to be a valid example or metaphor. And what I'm getting ready to state and share with you may not seem like a good example. But huge and widely popular gathering places like your local mall, or that regional mall that was the coveted destination of young and old just seemingly a few days ago. It used to be folks' weekly coveted destination. And all it took was a viral outbreak to place large gathering places like malls and most movie theaters on a trajectory to being monuments of the recent past. They closing down. I read an article the other day that in Harrisburg, the local mall just received demolition permits. They're going to tear half of it down. What they going to do? They're going to plant flowers and gardens? I don't know, but the mall is quickly becoming passe. Don't fool yourselves, beloved. Large faith fellowship gatherings have been placed on that very same path and trajectory. As the malls and most movie theaters? Yes, beloved. It's just evident in the smaller to mid-sized community churches and staples of the community of worship as of late and not at the mega centers. There are endless articles today that chronicle what appears to be the fading facade of modern organized Judeo-Christianity. The online news site, for example, The Atlantic, published an article last May titled How Politics Have Poisoned the Evangelical Church. Don't we know that to be the truth? It's becoming more divisive and more about what political side you're on than people coming together in fellowship and faith. Help us, Heavenly Father. The Baptist News Global reported in 2021 that the pandemic is putting a nail in the decline of the church as currently constructed. In a recent nationally published article the other day highlighted how the megachurch concept is actually experiencing widespread growth, but every other size and type of in-person fellowship gathering is in a rapid and complete freefall. Seems like that what's going on today is the converse of what Christ warned us in Matthew 7. He said, broad is the way that leads to destruction, but all of us appear to be not you all in the landscape. We know that you all know and are individually called and appointed and purposed, but a large degree and modicum of society is headed to the stadium. Despite the fact that where more people are gathered and widely and broadly accepted, oftentimes Christ is cautioning us that that path leads to peril. People in large numbers, large numbers are trading in participation to be a part of, to personally nurture their own individual purpose so that they can be an impact on the kingdom. It seems like in large numbers, people are trading in personal participation for wide-scale convenience. It's more convenient to go there. It's more exciting to go there. They don't hold as long. <laughs> They're trading in personal service, rolling up one's sleeves, as it were, and getting personally involved and being able to impact, even if you're not the greatest singer, even if you're not the most excited or the most charismatic preacher, even if you're not, I don't know, whatever. You still have a role. You still have the capability of being able, whatever it is that the Most High has imparted in you to be able to share with the body to expand this kingdom here on earth. Seems like people are trading that in, personal service, 
volunteering, and individual participation for lights, cameras, and action for concert, stadium sound, and production. Fluffy feel good sermons, lightning fast lessons, and super abbreviated gathering times. I was speaking with the person in the landscape just this past week, and they were talking about they attended a service where the the gathering was a half hour. And that oftentimes that the minister's sermon is five to ten minutes. Some of y'all was like, yeah, you need to learn from that shepherd man. Like, <sighs> people are trading in their dedication for that which takes up less time and less personal resources. Our current generations, however, are beginning to see right through these charades and attempts to remain relevant amidst changing times. I seem to recall that the apostle wrote in his epistle that uh, Jesus Christ is the, day, the same today, yesterday, and forevermore. But it seems like that people are more focused on trying to remain relevant with the changing times than they adhere to what scripture states. But I digress. And the current generations are beginning to see right through this charade by passing all together on faith entirely and on belief itself. Or, as an alternative, simply buying into the adversary's new age, occultist version of metaphysical manifestation, which is Holy Ghost light or diet. All of the positive spiritual outcomes, just think it, sister girl, just think it, bruh, just manifest it in your thoughts and it shall be so. It sounds powerful. All of the positive spiritual outcomes with none of the faith walk and none of the belief in the actual Holy Spirit. The interesting thing is that historically speaking, none of this phenomenon that is taking over the world and sinking the modern church establishment happens to be anything new. It has happened many times before these demonic efforts have even been chronicled throughout scripture in many different forms to try to get people to move from a dedication and a press as it were and to just become lethargic and laissez-faire in their walk, almost to the point where future people that would see the light in faith almost see nothing, which renders it pointless. Yes, it's happened throughout scripture, consequently. And it just so happens that allowing the carnal world to dictate the measures in which faith can and will survive in this petri dish, as it were. How do we thrive? I, I hear the negative things that you're commentating with regard to where ministry and Christ and Nami is, and I even concur with a lot of what you're saying, Shepherd Man, but the gist, are you going to give us solutions today? How do we survive? Well, it just so happens that in Scripture, allowing the carnal world to dictate the measures in which faith can survive and will survive have never been the most high solution, obviously, for the sustenance of his chosen people. Every time they went the direction of the Gentiles, every time, even in the Hebrew scriptures, where they violated the sanctity and the consecration that occurred with regard to him giving them the law, the Israelites, that is, they, it led them askew and led them in direct violation against the Most High's will, and it led them utterly into either captivity or destruction. And we haven't learned those lessons as of yet, it appears. But it was never the Most High's will that we began to put a little bit more of that sexy, I'm getting ready to get in trouble, that the, the sexy things that's in today's modern music. Let's bring some of that into the church. I think we can appreciate a little bit of the church in our R&B, but should we be putting a little bit, I better leave that alone. I better leave that alone. The Christ stated to his followers in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10, 
verses 38 and 39. And in this instance, we're going to be referencing, once again, the New International Version. It states, whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Now, does that sound like that we need to do less and less? These are the Christ's words himself we're quoting. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Christ states, whoever finds their life will lose it. What? I'm not trying to lose my life. And he states, whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Now, is that a standard that appears in largesse and widespread to be the standard that we're upholding today in ministry? Or are we trying to get a little bit more like the world? Beloved, the answer to turning this tide of decompression from the faith has never been to further dilute the faith. It has and always will be a greater desperation for and on behalf of faith. Scriptures state that neither Paul the apostle, for example, nor the Christ, for that matter, were super good looking in their personal, natural appearance. They weren't polished. They weren't regal with gold and purple adorned in the modern logo designers of that day when they appeared before people. They, Paul was shipwrecked and beat up and, and, and sick and infirmed and the Christ was dark-skinned and nappy and dusty and, and uh, sandaled and Nowhere to lay his head. In so many regards, one can say that they appeared to be raggedy, yet had a vehement desperation to fulfilling the purpose which the Most High placed them and placed in them to fulfill with regards to salvation, extending grace to his most treasured creation despite the raggedness of their appearance, there was clear vehement desperation in their faithfulness. That's all we're saying today. <laughs> well, would it have helped if Paul had agents and if he had uh, marketing people, and if somebody was instructing him to purchase ads on uh, the Insta stone. Uh, okay, that, I didn't even think that was funny. But, you know, the Instagram of that day, I don't know what, we, what it was called or, you know, the, the, the popular annals, interactions and things of that nature. Would Christ had done better and fared better if, you know, he had a, a, you know, a Hollywood studio behind his message? No, despite the raggediness of their walk, Look at what they accomplished in that day and time as opposed to what it appears in the soul of men, beloved, that we're accomplishing in this day and time. All of, now, I'm not against per excellence. It may be slow, but we are on a trek and it is what the Holy Ghost mandates for even exact and truth ministries that we present ourselves in the excellence and the possibility for excellence that even the resources, sometimes menial that we have nonetheless, but irrespective of what you present, present it in the excellence of the most, I do the best that you can. That's one of the reasons why we haven't come fully back as far as in person. Yeah. One of the reasons why, you know, uh, people are lagging behind like you, Shepherd Man, is because y'all won't come back to church. Uh, the rest of the world is back. No. It's because if we cannot do what we do in the excellent fashion of holiness that the Most High has dictated, that's a whole nother message. Back to our text, the Israelite judge Gideon was instructed to send the mega church sized crowd home that gathered, said, sure, we're willing to fight for the homeland, we're willing to fight for the liberty of our people. Uh, lay out the China right here. And you're not holding uh, the flatware properly. And 
if you're going to drink from the river, make sure that you press uh, that thumb against uh, that index and that you hold. No, 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 no. He sent the mega church size crowd home for a small unit of desperate men assembled to fight to retake the freedom of the Israelites from their Midianite oppressors. It was just a handful of them. But when they were gathered and when the Most High told Gideon to observe the chosen 300, I believe, was the number. They were desperate. They were gulping up the water from the river with, with their hands. They weren't trying to be neat at all. And that's who the Most High instructed Gideon to utilize, to save, and to free Israel. In the Gospel of John chapter 5, the impotent man, suffering his infirmity, Scripture states, for 38 years, every season of the annual feast in which the Heavenly Father would dispatch an angel to enter into the pool of Bethesda, and once the angel would exit that pool, the waters were troubled for the first person into that pool and they would receive healing from their malady. This impotent man, suffering his malady for 38 years, would gather and try at the time of that feast and at the troubling of the waters to be the first person in the water after the angel of the Most High troubled him. Even though he was disabled and had no one there to help place him in the water. So he never ended up being the first person and never ended up being healed subsequently. Yet he gathered nonetheless in desperation in some glimmer of hope that maybe this time I'll be able to make it. Some of us get discouraged after our first interaction that's negative on an auxiliary or on a committee. Some of us, we hear news of something crooked going on in the fellowship gathering because guess what? There is no perfect fellowship gathering. <laughs> the, the first news of something being arrived, we're discouraged and ready, ready to throw the towel in. This man gathered for years seemingly with no hope of even being able to get in the water because he needed help getting in the water because of his infirmity, yet he was desperate enough to show up nonetheless. Raggedy, tattered, and torn, but still present, even though he was disabled and had no one to help him. Until his faithfulness landed him with a direct encounter with the Christ himself that healed him without even having to get into the water. Why? Because he continued to show up. Hebrews 10 and 25, I believe, don't forsake the assembling of oneself as the manner of some do. There's a great forsaking that's going on, but what are you going to do? People are trading in. <laughs> trading in. The raggedy walk that oftentimes is old school, prayer, and consecration, and dedication. They're trading that in for a dressed up ride. I'm coming to tell you this morning that if your walk is raggedy, and even if you showing up with one leg and a half of lung, <laughs> even if you still got a fever, even if you don't feel good like Shepherd Man this morning, I'm telling you that a raggedy walk is better than a dressed up ride because people are going where they can dress up their ride. They can dress up their assembly. They can dress up the interaction and the fellowship. They can make it polished. They can make it camera ready. They can make it cute and beautiful. They can make it technologically brilliant and acceptable and appealing to the masses. And they're still losing out because that is not which leads to life eternal. The broad way is not the way, beloved, despite how beautiful it may look and appeal to the carnal eye. I've got one more example, the hemophiliac woman in Luke chapter eight. That scripture says, bled for 12 years straight, utilized the last of her strength to press through a crowd 
in order to simply reach out and with the last vestiges of strength that she had left, grab only the hem of the garment of the Hamashiach in hope and faith that she could obtain some type of relief. And it just so happens that just grabbing the hem of the Hamashiach's garment was good enough for him to feel holy virtue leave from out of him and he turned and he said, who touched me? And when he recognized that it was this bleeding weak and sickly woman, he told her that your faith has made you whole. Beloved, I'm telling you today that so many of us <laughs> may be trying and striving and fighting discouragement because, listen, the recession is just about to kick in, but it already kicked in for you. Some of you all are already losing and being laid off from jobs. So many of you all of the pandemic funds and help and all of the COVID relief all of the stimulus is gone. And you just trying to do your best to persevere. Listen, you may not have even been wise with all of the prosperity of the past, but you don't want to be destroyed because of it. But the discouragement and the mounting bills and the mounting pressure is causing you to feel like, man, and when you look at, out and you see so many people doing well, but so many people doing well seemingly not adhering to the principles of the doctrines of our creator. It can become very tempting to try to dress your walk up a little bit, to dress your ride up, as it were, a little bit, and, and to gather among the people that seem like that they're doing better because they're doing less. Gather among that crowd that seem like that things are working out and they're prospering because they're doing less, because they're taking out less time, because they're putting less focus on their faith and on the spirit, because they're individualized, they're, because they're leaning into the narcissism, as it were, because they're saying, listen, it's about me. Listen, I've got to certainly try to thrive. You know, if anybody else in my cipher have hopes of being successful, I got to think of me first. I got to put me first. Beloved, I'm telling you all that that's not the scriptural way. I'm telling you that the scriptural way is the day is the way of desperation. I said that the uh, hemophiliac woman with the bloody issue was the last situation, but I seem to recall King David, even at the height of his kingdom, was so desperate for praise until he embarrassed his wife and his family because when he was in worship and when he was praising the Most High, his clothes got a little loose and he did not let that deter him from continuing to praise and it embarrassed his people and he didn't care. The psalmist said, it's one thing that I desire and that I'll seek after, that I might dwell in the house of the Most High all the days of my life. And he didn't just say it. It wasn't just lip service. It wasn't just a popular lyric solely, but it was the way that he lived. He was grateful for all that the Most High had done and how he had preserved him through the tenure of surviving Saul and even through his own missteps with Bathsheba and Uriah. And despite the elegance of his kingdom, he wasn't so regal that he couldn't praise out of his garments. How many of you all are willing to put forth an embarrassing praise to the Most High despite what you're going through? No, circumstances in this day and time would have you to be decent and in order to put your beard on before you eat to make sure that you are eating with the right fork. Don't eat with the salad fork when you're eating your dinner and the dinner fork when you're eating your salad to be organized. But we need somebody in this day and time of decompression of faith with the world seemingly going to hell to get desperate and praise in such a radical way until if your clothes get a little loose, you ain't worried about what you look like online. You're not worried about what people are saying about you because you realize that it is far better to let your walk be raggedy and effective than to have a walk that is polished and have a ride that's leading you straight to destruction. Forgive me for being a couple of minutes late even this morning. Well, it seems like it's that way every week, but even the more so today because it took me a while to put my uh, 
hoodie on and, and I didn't get a chance to shave like we oftentimes like to do. And I really didn't feel like showing up this morning as far as the health in my body, but the Most High was speaking. So we had to get to you this morning because I realized that although I feel raggedy, His strength is made perfect in my weakness. And thus, his grace is sufficient for me. Won't you continue to walk in desperation despite what everybody else is doing? Won't you uphold your prayer life even if the folk on the job is saying that their prayers ain't been answered so they don't pray no more? Won't you resist decompression? Won't you resist minimizing the time that you spend with the Father one-on-one -on -one in your prayer closet in your heart despite the trend that it seems like the less is more in this day and time. Less is not more, beloved. It never has been. It never will be. I believe a great revival is coming. And I'm getting ready to pray in close. I believe a great revival is coming. That he's going to utilize his true elect Even in this day of time, this day of time is the perfect staging for light to refract darkness. But we're not going to be in a position to be used if we fall in that uncanny snare that the adversary is placing before us to join everybody. Listen, I'm not against mega churches. That's not even what this is about. I'm telling you that people, it's, I'm just blessed that people are trying to pursue faith at all, but people... Don't you lie to yourself, a lot of people with gifts and callings are running and sitting around doing nothing. They do not have time on a broadcast with 50,000 people and with millions of dollars of technology going towards a polished presentation. They do not have time for all 1,000 of you all that have a praise gift to praise on that same program. So what are you doing there? There's somebody that needs somebody to praise and to break through in a small village in Africa and you somewhere in the balcony watching your favorite singer. You ain't being obedient. That's the point that the Holy Ghost is making. How are we going to be instrumental in this great revival that he's going to send across this globe that he's preparing? If you too busy being a fan, and not being utilized for his purpose yourself. Broad is the way down that path where everybody is going. It looked good. It's shiny. It's exciting. But he has called us to the raggedy, beautiful nature of spreading the good news, the God spell as it were. Just so happens that you don't mind, we're going to pray. You don't mind being a part of. But this is a sad season and I'm not trying to be insensitive. We've got some things we got to do. Christ, I got an uncle that passed. Let me bury him first. Christ, I'm going to tell you the same thing that Christ said. And he wasn't trying to be insensitive. He was trying to make a point with regards to what the paramount initiative and precedent should be in his kingdom, which is the same which is the rescue sozos means. The original Greek word for saved in the New Testament. So let the dead bury the dead. Take up your cross and follow me. Amen. Would you join me in praying as we close? Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for this admonition to stay the course and to continue to press and persevere, to not get lazy, to not become laissez-faire in our attitude, despite the fact that it seems like that does, that's the popular approach. Those are the people that have members. That's the situation that's thriving, the people that are requiring less, the people who are embracing less time, lighter messages, even political messages that don't involve you at all. By the time we get done protesting and pressing, pressing People don't even know how to interject you in their lives so that they can grow spiritually as well as naturally. Lord, forgive us. And we will not be remiss ever to offer the notion and what we feel is reality that this forgiveness is nigh us because of that powerful and precious sacrifice of your son, the Hamashiach on the cross that died but didn't stay dead, rose again 
where right now currently he is ascended and sitting on your right hand, Heavenly Father, making intercession for each and every one of us that believe, of which we believe this powerful admonition today is an example of said intercession. And we're asking that you enter into every heart of those that believe. Don't forget those that stand in the need of prayer. Some people will hear this powerful admonition and even exhortation today. Great degree of encouragement, even in the reproof. But yet and still, they are stand somewhat in doubt because of their circumstances. We know that you're bigger than any of our circumstances. And we're asking right now that you remember those healing mind, body, soul, and spirit because everybody doesn't simply need a natural or physiological healing. Some people need a healing of their very heart, mind, soul, and spirit. And we're asking that you extend that heavenly father. We thank you for the strength that you've given us and we believe in the furtherance of the strength. And we're asking right now that you put a hand of appointment upon the things that we're going to do, even throughout the duration of this year, that you order our steps and that you have your way. And we ask these blessings and many more in that great name. Yeshua, Yehoshua HaMashiach, in Christ's name we pray. Beloved, in faith. Some of y'all is like, Chevy man, take your time. We thank so many of y'all who are well-wishers that are concerned, that genuinely love. Take your time, man. You know, uh, rest up. You know, we, we stand by the Exact and Truth Ministries. And we don't say this often, but y'all, don't forget to give. Don't continue to go to the trough and draw and never do anything to replenish. Amen. Y'all know we ain't one of them type of ministries that want to turn you upside down and shake you. But once again, some of the great things and the onset of the revival that's coming is going to take resources. So we just want to take out the time to just say, don't just give well wishes, give tangibly. Uh, ways that you can give is right there on that page, on that Facebook page. But listen, beloved, so many of y'all are like, take your time, shepherd man, rest up. We're with you. But we believe that there is power in the raggediness. So raggedy or not, we're going to be safe. We're we going to try to test negative, praise the most high. But uh, we're believing that this Wednesday will be in person, followed by a powerful in-person meet us this coming Saturday, next Saturday, the 28th. We're going to have such a rich time in fellowship. Amen. Uh, please meet us there. The information is on the page as well. And until then, Shabbat Shalom. We love you. There's not a whole lot you can do about it. Continue to pray for us as we pray for you. Have a blessed Saturday, Saturday.